the session to uh, John. Uh, over to you, John, please uh, take over. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's a really a great pleasure to, uh, to be here and to be uh, virtually present um, at the Inclusive Finance India Summit um, and, and to experience this uh, in, in COVID times. So thank you very much for putting it on and thank you very much for partnering on this subject, which is really um, near and dear to the heart of myself and, and, and all of Axion. Um, you know, Axion is a, a global not-for-profit that's sort of dedicated to creating a financially inclusive world. And, and we do that in a, a number of ways. Um, and digital financial inclusion is, is one of the key ways um, uh, we've been working both on the digital uh, uh, transformation of financial services companies in order to benefit the, the world's 3 billion uh, financially underserved people for, for several years, uh, and, and been looking at it both from the angle of uh, fintechs for inclusion, as well as uh, regulated microfinance entities and transforming them digitally in order to better serve our clients. And so I'm very much looking forward to hearing uh, the thoughts of this, uh, this uh, August panel on uh, how we can achieve that goal of not only uh, including that 3 billion people uh, financially, but also helping a large portion of them that are not connected digitally to connect to the, to the digital world and, and experience the power that digital financial services can have um, um, on their lives. Um, and we recognize that the, you know, the, the different segments of uh, fintech and uh, financial inclusion, uh, in some cases overlap, uh, in some cases compete, in some cases collaborate, um, and, and we'd like to explore with this group um, how best to do that from the, the financial inclusive inclusion uh, perspective. Um, I think one of the things that we've seen, um, as Radhika mentioned, uh, throughout this is that uh, all of the trends that we were seeing pre-COVID have only been accelerated. And in many cases, the digital trust factor that um, was perhaps lower uh, pre-COVID um, has, has gone up uh, quite a bit because of necessity. People who were reluctant to go online uh, uh, 9, 12 months ago uh, have had to um, and are increasing their digital footprint. We recognize at Exxon that that is uh, an uneven progress and that there are some parts of uh, some, some segments of the population where that's happening more slowly and some areas where that's happening more quickly. And I think one of the things that's topmost in, in our mind is uh, how do we uh, bring those that are um, uh, moving more slowly uh, along and, and not leave them behind and leave them excluded from, uh, from this rapidly developing world. Um, I, I think the other element that uh, is also important that, that's topmost in our minds, and, and I think we'll have the panelists talk about a bit, um, is the, the added risks to our clients, vulnerable populations of digital financial services. I think um, you know, throughout the years, the microfinance industry, the financial inclusion industry has gotten uh, uh, its mind around a, a set of principles related to uh, client protection um, in, the, in the physical world, but there's a whole new set of problems that arise as, as people go online. Um, and, and I think that's one of the key parts of this industry to, to try to uh, think ahead on and, and try to address um, uh, before, before we run into problems. Um, and then uh, perhaps the, the, the last element that I think uh, will be important as we discuss this, as uh, we have the industry, uh, we, have a we have regulators around the world who are also themselves trying to grapple with uh, many of these issues, trying to come up the, the, the learning curve on how best to regulate these sort of services, um, both from the fintech side, but then also from the client protection side. Um, and and um, I think we'll, we'll spend some time as a panel talking about what, uh, what the regulator approach might be to both of those those key aspects. Um, so uh, with that uh, brief introduction, what I'd like to do is, is uh, begin with our panel. Um, and um, what I'd like to sort of ask as we all talk about digitization, I think sometimes uh, we don't have the same definition of what that means. And what I'd love you to do, um, uh, each of you, is to describe what, is, what in your mind um, 
does digitization meet, especially as it relates to uh, financial inclusion uh, sector? And maybe I can ask uh, Satish if, if you can begin and uh, give us your views on, on what do you think of when you think of digitization? Oh, oh, when we say digitization, I think you have to uh, link it uh, intrinsically with the technological transformation of the uh, broader financial sector. When uh, microfinance sector is part of the broader financial sector, it can't escape the changes which are taking place there uh, because it is intrinsically linked in terms of both uh, uh, what we can say in terms of credit flow, in terms of financial services uh, with the mainstream financial sector. So whatever changes with regard to the uh, technology upgradation which is taking place in this uh, financial services sector in the last 20 years, uh, I would say um, because if you are if you uh, basically uh, if you are to put it in a simple language, I would say that uh, transformation from a systems where uh, you have been using uh, more of a physical mode into systems where uh, non-physical modes are being used both in the institutions and their uh, systems and processes and the institutions in their uh, interaction with their clientele at the field level and at the client level. At all these places, a transformation from a physical mode to a non-physical mode of transactions. Uh, that I would put it in a uh, in, in terms of a, a digital uh, financial transformation. It could be a variety of ways. Um, in some places, uh, uh, the base would be more of uh, using the mobile phone technology. But in some places, it may be more in terms of uh, using the business correspondence with their point of sale machines. And some places, even uh, the um, uh, immediate field level uh, banking institution with its, uh, digital products, uh, that could be the alternative depending on uh, the situation. So uh, I would not like to go into the other things. I wanted to confine only to your question. I would only say is that uh, uh, transforming from uh, uh, existing physical mode, including uh, pen and paper mode, to a mode where uh, uh, which is non-physical in various uh, uh, dimensions. That I would put it in terms of a, a digital financial transformation. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. And um, perhaps I can ask uh, Shweta. I, I know that you've been working on on both sides of, of the fintech side, and as well as. Uh, uh, financial include digital financial inclusion side of, of businesses. Maybe uh, you, you can give your thoughts on on when when you hear digitization, what, what what's top most in your mind? Thank you, John, and thank you, Satishi. Um, so the the way uh, at least we look at digitization is is really a process of uh, optimization. So um, if you look at uh, a typical life cycle, whether it is an inward facing life cycle of a company or it is an external um, life cycle where we are engaging the customer, how do we bring in the right set of tools, whether it is in the form of technology or whether in the form of just process re-engineering um, is what I feel is the whole enhancement or the digital transformation. Um, good examples typically have been uh, in the MFI sector, more specifically is the repayment channel if you look at it. Uh, how do we take it from a cash uh, process to a non-cash process and how can we optimize that whole process? Um, the second could be how do we originate or form centers? Can we bring optimization so that the efficiency of the loan officer can be perhaps captured in doing something which is more uh, perhaps relevant as well as more value creation than doing a transactional activity? So different parts of the problem or different uh, sides of the opportunity um, which can be looked at and um, a new process can be implemented using technology is really in our minds um, is a digital framework. Uh, it can also perhaps take the language of customer experience. Uh, 
um, how is the customer looking at it? Um, how much of the financial literacy process can you digitize? Use of biometrics is a great example in that sense. Um, in many world, biometric was adopted much later than India, right? Uh, while we adopted biometric much earlier and customers got friendly with biometric because they felt that that was the right thing to do. And we improved the whole experience of using biometric to authenticate, to identify, to run KYC process. Another great example is computer vision or perhaps using that technology to identify faces during KYC process of customer loan origination. So a very complex technology at the back end for oversimplifying or simplifying a front end process can also be called digitization. Um, so that's what John, I think for me, it's all about optimization, not doing anything dramatic, but more importantly, really looking at the problems um, or the areas of opportunity um, and really bringing those improvements using the right technology and tools uh, to me is really um, the whole aspect of digital transformation. And like Satish, she said, of course, being very aligned to uh, what's happening overall from a regulatory standpoint, uh, systems like CKYC, uh, systems like UPI, um, systems which government is bringing in to leverage those and bring those efficiencies into your own processes is also digitization. So, so perhaps, you know, um, everything that you can use technology for the right reasons, uh, which is adding value uh, to me is really uh, the whole transformation journey on digital uh, for the customer and for the company. Good. Thank you for that, uh, Shweta. And, and I think that's a very useful uh, uh, way of thinking about it, both the, the, the internal side as well as the, the customer experience side. And maybe I can ask um, a Christian, if you don't mind, to, to go into a little more detail on and, and how you see the customer experience side um, and, and the work that, that you've been doing at Benarta uh, on, on that front. Because yep. um, uh, I think that that element is something that um, not only brings efficiency, but also brings um, uh, improvement to the lives of, of our customers. Sure. So I agree anyways, so far with what was mentioned. So there are two elements which are very important. One is internal. So how we digitize internal processes to make the company more efficient, to make, make it, uh, um, you know, make processes faster. And this, uh, this reflects uh, on uh, the, uh, you know, the other type of digitalization, which is more towards the clients, you know. And in our mind, digitalizing the relationship with clients has been always uh, uh, adding additional, let's say, adding other channels for clients to contact us and for us to contact the clients. And this has become more and more important in the last year during COVID because of course, contacting clients physically was becoming more and more difficult. So we had to uh, accelerate the introduction initially of basic ways to contact clients. And then gradually we are developing more sophisticated ways for clients to contact us and for us to contact the clients. Uh, but the, the idea of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, digitalization and why we started this process in Binarta to uh, transform digitally uh, uh, was uh, born somehow by a change in vision. So we, we, uh, we ask ourselves how we can, uh, um, you know, reach clients uh, uh, more in depth because so far and, and in the past, we've always been uh, perceived as a credit provider only. And, uh, and we wanted to try to shift and, and change the paradigm of, of the company and trying to uh, be perceived as a business partner and, and the business partner, not only for the traditional clients, so the, only, the low income uh, uh, women running uh, micro businesses, but, but for the family. No? So, so uh, starting from that uh, perspective, we say, OK, uh, um, so how we can uh, reach clients more in depth, how we can offer other services to clients uh, and, and the traditional methodology was not uh, ideal to do so. So uh, at that point, we started to understand and, and trying to understand whether we could add digital channels to uh, add layers of product and services to what we're doing now. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and the process basically started at the beginning of last year. And now we are in the, in the process of developing, uh, developing a, a customer engagement platform, which uh, will uh, initially be... Uh, a simple way for clients to contact us, asking information, to, to apply for loans uh, uh, and, and to check the status of their current loans. Uh, but then gradually will become a way for clients to uh, um, uh, you know, uh, require 
uh, additional product and services. So to, to, to go through the full process of, of uh, receiving a loan or to ask uh, uh, for uh, insurance product and so on and so forth. So, so uh, it, uh, we, uh, we believe that the process of digitalization must be done gradually, uh, starting with uh, you know, introducing uh, um, something that clients can use sim uh, simply in, in a simple way, and then gradually uh, make the offer through digital channels a bit more, uh, more and more, let's say, sophisticated. Um, and, and at the same time, we believe uh, um, that uh, it's extremely important to maintain an hybrid methodology. So we don't believe in full transformation because we know and, and we serve 90% uh, rural clients. So, so we are really focusing on rural, uh, uh, in, um, uh, let's say, uh, regions in Indonesia. And, uh, and, uh, and, and we know very well that many clients don't have access yet to, to smartphones. And even if they do have access, they don't use smartphone, smartphone to access uh, digital services. So we did a, a survey uh, at the beginning of the, this project, and we found out that only 16% of our clients were using smartphones to access digital uh, uh, payment services, uh, though 70% of the family had a smartphone. So, so we are far from a moment in which we can really transform fully, and, uh, and therefore we want to maintain our physical network in the field, and, and the digital part is, a, is a, 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 an add-on and to allow uh, clients to reach us in different ways and to, uh, you know, and to access services in different ways. Well, thank you very much, Christian. Um, I know that uh, DJ at Annapurna, you've been, been working hard on this, uh, th this area. Um, perhaps you could give some, some of your experiences in uh, digitization at, at Annapurna um, and, and what you've seen, uh, especially relating to, to the client experience um, but then also I know that they've done a lot of work in terms of thinking about uh, uh, how to make uh, operations more efficient, et cetera. Um, so it'd be great to hear about those, those two elements. Well, uh, thanks, John. Uh, I think uh, from our experience at Annapurna uh, in the process of digitization, and you know, we've, we've been working with uh, Action around uh, that program, you know, it's basically under two things. One is um, the services that we provide to the clients, uh, you know, the processes that we follow, whether it is an internal process or an external process, if that process, which is today uh, maybe dealt uh, manually or physically by somebody, can that be replaced by a technology? That is uh, number one. Number two, how, how can we bring in a more efficiency, flexibility uh, from the customer's point of view, you know, what the customer's needs are, and, you know, if there's a technology available, which can then help us to serve them. Like, for example, nowadays we are talking about, you know, in a very highly personalized, uh, you know, loan uh, requirement, uh, you know, uh, you know, we were always, you know, in a, in a JLG model, it is always followed in a cycle kind of thing, but you don't need to do that. You know, if you have a proper technology, each individual can be served, can be underwritten, and given an individual a dose of loan, it can be made a lot of flexibility in terms of how they can pay you instead of following a weekly or a monthly uh, payment mode. Uh, they can be given a lot of optionalities in terms of their repayment uh, you know, methodologies. Uh, you, know, you don't have to go visit them and get the money. They can pay you digitally. Their, mon their time is also equally important. Why do you want to? Uh, go and meet them physically. You can meet them uh, virtually, like the way we were meeting. You know, so, so what are the things that can be replaced? I believe uh, at Annapurna, we all believe that everything will be replaced over a period of time. It's just about time, or just about starting somewhere. And we have taken that step. There are some missing uh, links, like you know, in India, we are yet to you. You know, we were not allowed to use Aadhaar, or we, you know, we, I think we will. Uh, get into that when the regulatory things, you know, you will ask us uh, the challenges around that. And some of the areas like the infrastructure, you know, being a rural MFI, uh, you know, the, we are, what we are facing is a infrastructure. But also the fact that we are a very technologically advanced country. You know, uh, you know the, 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 uh, the designers, the engineers, you know, they supply this to <laughs> the entire world. And why can't we just, you know, fine tune some of them you know, and uh, reimagine the things, you know, you have, and, and I think uh, COVID has actually created a, a huge space uh, 
uh, in this uh, particular segment where you know you can actually rethink everything you know you 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 know the inaccessibility you know so the uh, so the uh, uh, deficiency in the system was also uh, taken up during covid you know you could you could feel the heat that you know i am not in a position to access my client or i am not in a position to deliver you know a loan if it is required at her end or ec is not in a position to do a transaction you know if she is not uh, technologically enabled enough but uh, I, i mean i think from from our side uh, from anapurna side uh, for us digitization is this you know to bring in efficiency and to replace anything that a machine can do better than a human being we would like to replace it by a machine you know it you don't, you don't need a human being to do it because machines are always efficient you know human beings are there to do much greater and uh, larger uh, you know uh, things you know maybe more customer care more time spending time with quality time with customer try and understand um, their requirement their needs than you know just uh, filling up the forms or you know for example as you know naswata ma'am was also mentioning that you know it can be as small as you know reading from the kyc you know just put a very small very basic level of uh, you know technology that can save a lot of time for the person who is uh, going there and you know typing everything on his uh, app uh, you know so so those basic things also from that to complex uh, underwriting you know bringing more data bringing the footprint into it uh, trying to understand if i can underwrite a client uh, you know from that to that complexity i think i think digitization has a huge uh, space and scope and uh, moreover the uh, pandemic has actually pushed us to rethink about it we you know uh, we we at all we were all thinking that digitization we you know we at least all agree to this that digitization will happen you know if it not today tomorrow but now i think this pandemic is pushed us all towards that probably which we were thinking that it will happen in 5 years you will see that happening in 2 years time so so that is how the things are uh, you know moving you know if you have um, people who are uh, street vendors who are uh, accepting phone pay now uh, you know they can take the payment from you uh, we i can very well underwrite them on their phone pay transactions you know so mm-hmm. a lot of things uh, there's a lot of possibility now i think in digitization space no th- thank you for that and 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 i i'm hearing a couple of themes that i'd love to 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 come back to i think uh, uh, one of them is is uh perhaps we we talk a little bit about this this change from covid and i think there there we were all seeing these trends that that uh, dj was mentioning uh pre covid uh, uh, several years back um that that digitization was gradually uh, encroaching in in and and becoming available in uh, the markets we serve um i think in many countries we've seen um the uh, digital acceptance uh accelerate and and that on a number of fronts of of what what the technology is available uh to our clients is the the trust factor um that our clients have in in those technologies but perhaps um a question you you mentioned this uh uh very low um access to smartphones and usage of smartphones for for financial uh services have you seen um that element start to change under covid or um are you seeing any trends um uh, towards faster digitization uh due to covid no for sure for sure it's happening and uh so in our specific case uh, initially because we could not enter the villages so very practically we we ask clients to make themselves available on the phone and uh, and to to use whatsapp when it was possible so we were contacting them uh, uh, regularly just to make sure that uh, you know everything was fine to check the situation in the village to organize the payment of of of, of the of the you know installments and and gradually we started to uh, Uh, upload also some training that they could uh, go through uh, uh, about you know how to maintain uh, uh, to 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 keep safe from covid uh, how to you know wash their hands probably very simple things and and we we saw that they were appreciating and using whatsapp much more so that we could we could contact them gradually on whatsapp so so somehow uh, uh, the the fact that they they usually have within a family at least one phone no and 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 very often they have a smartphone now 
but uh, especially our clients, because uh, you know, for now the average age of, of our clients is uh, 35, 40 years old. So we are not, uh, 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 but uh, probably only marginally uh, reaching the younger generation. And this is why we change also the, our our vision to try to look into family and not only to the traditional clients that we always serve. But gradually we saw that also our segments started to use a bit more uh, the phone, but we still believe uh, and uh, and, um, and, uh, and this is proving for now quite uh, quite true that we need to maintain a, a network in the field because we still need to, to to carry the clients along the process of, of digitalization they need someone to help them you know very simply to, to download the application to onboard into the app uh, to start using the services and the beginning will be the loan officer doing that for them and then gradually you know, uh, uh, day by day, month by month, they will start using the app by themselves. And if they, they cannot or they don't want to, we cannot exclude them, of course. So, so people need to be there still to, to support them. So I see still the process to be a gradual process. And I believe that, you know, center meeting and people in the field will always be important, but they will change role. Uh, they will change gradually role. They will be more exactly focusing on customer services, uh, uh, you know, high value sort of uh, services uh, and, and less on, on, on processes and, and bureaucracy. So, so I agree with the day about this. Um, and and we, we are trying to uh, think of a model in which center meetings becomes service hubs so that, uh, uh, you know, some products, some services can be uh, uh, can be ordered through an application, but then if uh, the person wants to access physically or to collect the good, they can go to the center meeting, which will be a service hub at that time, and collect the good physically. And and then gradually center leader can also have a role because they learn how to use the app into uh, uh, delivering services to the dealers themselves without our support, and uh, and 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 they can get a margin out of it, so they can get a source of income. So. So we see this, uh, this model, which we call FIGITAL, which is a mix between digital channels and physical uh, uh, presence, because we believe that some level of physical presence uh, maintain the, the, the relationship that we build in so many years. And, uh, and this is our real competitive advantage towards fintechs. So this is why uh, you know, we still have a role, because otherwise we would have been, been dead already. You know? I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, uh, there are so many fintechs in, in, in Indonesia. You have huge ones as well, like go, uh, go, uh, go back and, and, uh, and, and grab. Um, so, so it's important to really maintain this role, this uh, relationship with clients. But we need to modernize ourselves. We need to innovate for sure. Well, thank you for that. Um, one, I um, think, um, uh, Shweta, you, you, you've uh, thought a little bit about this question that Christian brought up of, of how do you um, transition your own workforce into um, that, that value add that, that you mentioned at the, at the outset. Um, maybe you can talk through that because I think one of the fears of digitization is, is that uh, it's going to have a terrible impact on unemployment, um, uh, people who, who previously had work as, as uh, loan officers will, will be put out of work and replaced. Um, but, but it seems like at least there, there's some consensus among a number of members of, of the panel that uh, it's sort of a repurposing. And I wonder if you could, you could speak a little bit to that and, and also how that, uh, you know, how you've seen that evolve um, over the past uh, nine months as we've been trying to work from, from home, uh, socially distanced uh, meetings, things like that. Yeah, yeah thanks. Thanks, John. And it, I think this is, to me, has been the biggest learning, uh, I think, uh, post-COVID. But I think in general, how do you transition from uh, one model to jumping into something else that you're trying to achieve? And I think even for us at Earth, um, Traditionally, you will get the type of, uh, you know, team members or employees on ground who have um, been part of the core, um, core school way of doing lending. Let me just say that. Um, so for us also, at least uh, during COVID, what happened when we wanted them to become the champions to do outreach to customer, even something as small as that, right? 
um, we had to first do sessions virtually with them that what do you really do in the outreach? What are the kind of questions you need to ask the customer? It's not about just asking them for a, you know, sort of loan repayment or just telling them that they should go and sort of deposit the money into the closest bank. Um, so it was really also in terms of a lot of behavior retraining that we had to do with our own team members, which is just purely during COVID. Second is in terms of using, so during COVID, we also built a very easy uh, use chatbot for our own teams, internal teams. And we use that mechanism to very quickly send information to our teams who were uh, sitting in different parts of India. And that was used as a mechanism to tell them what do they need to tell, what are the questions, uh, what is the kind of information, what is the EMI schedule, because many loan officers were not able to access desktops that were at the branches or the centers, etc. So even, even the utility of the chatbot had to be trained first and to be explained to them that, you know, this is now sitting on your phone, you will get notifications, please check that, and then perhaps use this information to do outreach. We had some success, but later when we came out of it, we actually acknowledged the fact that a lot of the training was needed um, internally in terms of all levels of teams, whether it was a loan officer, and we in internally call them as wealth officers and loan officers, uh, cluster coordinators, um, sakhis, these are women coordinators who only work on welfare services. And we basically started doing these group exercises where we said that, you know, they need to be trained in terms of how the customer engagement is going to change and what are the type of questions you need to ask the customer so that you have the right level of empathy as well as the right level of balance, um, which is to do with now you need to go in and you sort of collect, uh, you know, your repayments. So we did a lot of those trainings and they were very periodic. We did virtual. Uh, we also did all hands. So it was a lot of uh, sort of grooming, I would say, which had to happen. Second level, what we did, John, which was interesting is we hired a lot of freshers. Uh, and this was another thing which we consciously did. So one, one thing that you could do is, of course, hire somebody who comes from the same network. The second thing we realized was that maybe hiring people who were directly coming from colleges were better equipped to be trained to the new model. So at every center slash branch, we started recruiting for graduates and freshers who were coming in and bringing the new sort of, you could say, very fresh level of thinking because they had no history of what a typical or old school model looks like. So we have now created a good blend and mix of uh, people at each center and branch, which is old people. So there is handholding, there is knowledge. At the same time, a new crop, a new set of team members who have come in who have literally no experience of the past. So it's a tougher challenge for the company, but at the same time, it's more relevant because we need to now equip all of them with new, um, in a sense, not a way of working, but at least approach to customer, which is very different post-COVID. Mm -hmm. And unless everybody understands that the approach or the engagement to customers has to change, um, we'll not be able to be good active partner in the financing ecosystem. So that's the second thing. And third, of course, we have increased the level of monitoring tools as well. Um, so, you know, typically one would do is in your applications, you will have GPS coordinate tracking, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not about really monitoring who is going where. It's also about ensuring that a right set of information is provided to your teams so that they can engage the customer at the right time in the right place. So now we have developed tools, which are purely, you could say, um, loan officers engagement tools, which is we equip them with information to say that here are your list of customers. This is, you know, what was the last disposition about the customer as per the, uh, the customer, um, the call center team. And this is what you need to ask. The, uh, these are the set of questions you need to now take to the customer. And, and find out and send the latest disposition. Now, this itself is a new concept um, for somebody who is now going and talking about not a repayment, but literally like, how is your business now? How is uh, it? How was it affected? Uh, is your husband well now? Is your child going back to school? So these are the dispositions which we have now started capturing and started giving on the uh, on the field officers app as we call it, which is helping us change the way um, the, the, the reskilling in that sense of the teams are happening. So three-step process, uh, of course, the technology upgradation, 
second is bringing in old with the new so that there is a good blended composition of people and third of course is also giving them the tools to be able to better equip to engage the customer um, and these are the three things that we have done over the last uh, you could say 10 months um, to be better prepared uh, for a reset new world post covid no that's great uh, thank you and and perhaps i can ask a, a question came in about um, uh, uh, group center meetings uh, for for collection uh, um, and and whether it's possible desirable to replace those center meetings i i know that um at dj at anaporna you've been thinking about uh, sort of reimagining uh, group lending and and incorporating the transition to uh, um enterprise lending etc maybe you could uh, speak a little bit to your experiences in that of of how you uh, reimagine group lending um uh, during covid and then and then how that looks post covid well john uh, uh, first of all uh, when uh, the entire group architecture that you know we used to work uh, you know that uh, was actually very very feasible when the loan size were around 20000 rupees but when the loan sizes are going up you know we are talking about 60 70000 rupees to 1 lakh rupees uh, you know the new limit is 1.2 to 5 lakh rupees you need a serious underwriting you know you just can't do the basic check and you know give a loan and if you do that uh, you know the consequences are uh, what so i think uh, not only from the group lending perspective we all have to rethink from the underwriting perspective uh, you know how uh, equipped we are how better the technology can be used to underwrite these customers in a more uh, you know independent and uh, uh, you know in a more uh, uh, prudent manner uh, so that uh, you know that uh, can be taken care of you know otherwise if you keep doing the same group lending methodology and keep raising this bar of you know giving them loans maybe to start with if somebody is new uh, we at least at anapuna are thinking uh, even post before covid we have started thinking about it because what we have found that um you know during the demonetization and post that you know how our portfolios are behaved and we started looking at digging the data and try and understand where it is the problem so we started finding it that the problem is when the emis are goes beyond a particular uh, level then the chances of the defaults are high that means a particular level of loans and then we realized that if this particular level of loan we have to give we can't just go ahead and give them in a group lending methodology we have to seriously think about a individual way of underwriting them checking their you know 360 credit bureau try and understand what are the other requirement they have what are the cash flow what are the risk involved and then underwrite that kind of a loan so to to for me group lending till a level you know your first cycle third cycle second cycle or third cycle is okay to introduce them to a behavioral cultural aspect of uh, financial services but beyond that when you were thinking about a little larger ticket size loan or a smb loan going forward for them you know graduating them then it is a very very different uh, you know ball game all together and i think that is where um, the challenges are uh, it's easy uh, to organize people the methodology is well established and that's why uh mfis in india are not really uh moving towards that and uh, uh and and you know there are a lot of uh, so but i think eventually uh people will slowly slowly move uh, i'm sure move towards that and uh, start looking at uh, more individual loans at a higher size uh, but group lending would still be there in a lower size um uh, replacing uh the meetings uh in if you are in a group lending you really can't uh, replace that you know that's that's a sacrosanct uh, methodology you can't really ma- replace that but if you move them to much mature or individual lending space you can absolutely uh, do away with the group uh, you know meetings uh, th- thank you dj and 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 perhaps um uh you know i think i think we have a group of uh, you know fairly uh, a very forward thinking group of uh, entities with with uh, anapurna um arta binarta um 
perhaps Satish, you, you have a broader perspective over uh, what's happening throughout the uh, microfinance sector, how, how broadly microfinance entities are thinking about it. I would love to get your thoughts on, on this, this yeah. question of um, how uh, microfinance entities as a whole are approaching digitization and, and sort of the, uh, any acceleration that they're seeing uh, due to COVID and sort of what the long-term impacts you're seeing yeah. for the industry are. Yeah, uh, thanks, John. Uh, first thing is, uh, 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 I think all of our uh, practitioner uh, panelists have brought in their uh, perspectives from the institutions, and uh, uh, all of them are relevant. Uh, but main thing which uh, we should not forget the fact that uh, uh, one of the main contribution of the microfinance sector has been to take the uh, financial services to the doorstep. Uh, if by process of uh, digitization or uh, depending on another bigger entity, uh, if that advantage, if you are uh, nullifying, then I think that's something uh, negative for the microfinance sector. That's something which uh, we are always trying to guard uh, because even when uh, uh, demonetization happened and uh, almost 100% of the uh, uh, loan uh, sanctions were being credited to the bank accounts, uh, we are also apprehensive whether again uh, uh, the people have to travel to a, a bank branch uh, situated 20-25 kilometers to if they want to transact uh, their financial transaction. But fortunately, since uh, we had uh, established network of uh, banking correspondents and uh, most of the villages also had their uh, POS machines and even mobile was being uh, used in a big way. Uh, we were able to, the sector was able to maintain its uh, uh, doorstep delivery of financial services. And that I presume that uh, we should be able to do that when we continue even with uh, uh, digital uh, collection, which now uh, slowly uh, most of the institutions have started uh, using a lot of uh, now, as uh, uh, Deep Jyoti was mentioning, that there are a lot of uh, mechanisms and systems are now available because NPCA is taking a big role in uh, uh, taking the payment systems across and we have a lot, number of payment wallets and the payment banks, especially the India Post is willing to work with the microfinance sector uh, on the collection uh, side. Uh, so we will be able to do that. But uh, only thing is that uh, as a overall in the sector, uh, we are as a sector association, we are also uh, looking at the smaller institutions and weaker institutions uh, because they also should be enabled to uh, be on the digital uh, financial inclusion space. Uh, they also we find that as far as the internal processes are concerned, systems are concerned, most of the institutions are able to adapt, and though their uh, systems may not be as robust, but uh, there is always a, a willingness and there is always a, uh, there has always been a inclination to go towards uh, uh, digital transformation as far as their own uh, uh, systems and even uh, field operations are concerned and uh, dealing with their customers, all their uh, uh, loan uh, originating systems, uh, customer identification system and all. Uh, even the smaller institutions are now able to digitize uh, these processes uh, in a gradual way, though I would not say that it has happened 100%. Uh, but what we also find is that uh, in the uh, smaller end, uh, where uh, they're lagging is with regard to the uh, digitization of the collection practices. There we find that only of the MFIs uh, which have a, a loan book less than uh, 100 crores, only about 20 to 25 percent have been able to fully digitize the uh, collection uh, processes and systems. Uh, most of them are still uh, dependent on uh, cash collection uh, processes. Uh, so that's uh, something which uh, we will have to work. And uh, as a sector association, we are trying to see whether uh, in a broader way, uh, 
uh, whether uh, uh, we can uh, facilitate uh, the smaller institutions to access uh, uh, technology and uh, uh, as a sector as a whole. Uh, so that's something which we are working. Uh, we are working with uh, uh, DFIs uh, like BARD and SIDB to support this uh, uh, effort and also with some uh, uh, technology companies who have shown some interest in that. So we want to uh, not only uh, we want to say that uh, uh, the digital financial transformation should not only be uh, restricted to the institutions which are uh, having a, a better financial strength, but also middle and uh, lower end of the sector also should be able to uh, transform digitally uh, because there is an appetite there and there is a demand from the uh, clientele. So uh, that's the reason why uh, I think uh, I am, uh, uh, what, what I can say is that I am very optimistic uh, about the uh, digital transformation of the entire microfinance sector uh, gradually in the years to come. And uh, one aspect I wanted to touch upon what uh, Deep Jyoti was also mentioning uh, with regard to the group mode. Uh, uh, even um, in our um, code of conduct, with which Mfin and Sadhana have mentioned, that uh, they also said that uh, though the 1.25 lakh limit is there, uh, if it is, uh, if you are using the joint liability mechanism. Uh, let it not cross uh, 60,000 or 70,000. So that, uh, uh, and uh, we have also seen across the world also that uh, at uh, higher levels of uh, credit, uh, the joint liability system fails. So uh, I do agree that uh, at least I, I personally feel that at least when the loan amount crosses 60 or 70,000, uh, you have to bring in uh, better uh, uh, credit appraisal mechanisms uh, rather than just relying on a, a joint liability mechanism. But at the same time, we have to keep in the back of our mind that uh, uh, one of our strengths or one of our uh, uh, major uh, selling and talking points of the microfinance sector has been unsecured credit. So how with uh, individual limits going up, uh, to what extent? extent can we maintain this uh, unsecured uh, credit portfolios is also something which uh, along when we digitize and when we look at uh, uh, individual versus the group loaning, uh, that question also will uh, uh, bother the sector in the years to come. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, perhaps turning a little bit, um, and, and this, this uh, fits into a question that, that just came in, um, uh, re really on this question of, uh, we've been talking a lot about, I think, the benefits of digitization. I'm really happy to see all of the panelists talking about this from a, a non-fear factor, but from a, a mission factor, because I, at least I see uh, digitization as really responding to all of our missions to serve our clients better, more efficiently, more uh, more cheaply, et cetera. Um, I think we, we shouldn't neglect the, the, the sort of fear factor that uh, we are seeing on the horizon all around the world, uh, fintechs coming in uh, to the space, um, sometimes competing directly with us. Um, I, I think, at least in, in my own experience, um, you know, five, six years ago, the, the mantra from the fintechs was, uh, you know, uh, banks are finished, that's it, it's, it's gonna be fintech is the future, et cetera. Today, I'm seeing a much more uh, reasonable approach to it and a recognition that uh, licenses are important, that fintechs can do a lot and have a, a, a very important contribution. Um, but uh, the, the presence of that last mile um, that, that very often an MFI can provide to the, the clients um, is, is key that, you know, as we've talked about in this group, the, the digital footprint is is uh, not evenly distributed and, and uh, perhaps digital footprints are more intense in urban areas, less intense in, in rural areas, et cetera. But um, I would love to get your thoughts on, on the relationship between 
uh, digital financial inclusion on the one side and, and, and fintechs on the other, um, and, and how you see those two uh, overlapping. And I know, uh, Shweta, you, you're working on sort of both, both sides, um, and perhaps you, you can give some thoughts on, on how you see that, that relationship between fintech and, and digital financial inclusion uh, evolving. Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks, John. And I think um, I, I think the 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 good and uh, easy answer to this is that India is, is 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 a very very large country, and the opportunity is too big for any one model to really uh, succeed. Um, and even more so, if you look at how the uh, digitization in India overall as a country is happening, it has been gradual. It has accelerated over the last ten years, but it is still five to 10% of the entire country. So uh, while we see a range of fintech uh, companies come in, we ourselves, by the way, we also call ourselves as, as part of a fintech ecosystem because uh, our entire solutions are built on advanced tech. Uh, but we do have a blended approach to customer, which means that we have physical channels, we have centers and we have branches. So I think, I think both in terms of what fintechs, pure play fintechs, which are technology companies, uh, have a role to play um, more in terms of bringing whatever is already digitized uh, to the customers who have come up the learning curve, which is 10% of the overall population. We may have some 600 million smartphones in the country. Um, and to the earlier conversation, this doesn't mean that everybody is banking or using multiple use cases on their smartphone. They're using it for other purposes. Having said it, um, as far as the, the old school agencies are concerned, the MFI institutions are concerned, the cooperatives are concerned, the labs are concerned, the payment banks are concerned, the post is concerned. Um, there is a lot of play which needs to happen as far as the customer engagement on the ground uh, is concerned. And I think fintechs have not replaced that because fintechs are playing on the data which is available. And fintechs are working on really creating better processes, better methods to identify, originate, and of course, in some cases, even do credit appraisals better for a customer who's already digitized. And the, the companies on the contrary, which are the likes that I just mentioned, are actually acquiring that data still. And they're actually physically going and acquiring a large amount of self-declared data, a large amount of KYC, and a large amount of, you could say, other um, uh, data points like the Aadhaar numbers, the PAN card numbers, etc. So there is, you could say, many of these companies are actually helping uh, get a large number of customers digitized, while on the contrary, the fintechs are using whatever is already digitized. So they are not going to, in a sense, in the immediate future, uh, overlap or take each other's territory in that sense. Having said it, the way I look at it uh, is, is a large play on collaboration and partnership which can happen. Uh, MFIs can, to a large extent, are actually, if you, if you look at it from an opportunity standpoint, I say MFIs are very well placed because they have so much data. The challenge is a lot of this data is not very fine and not very structured in that sense. Um, and we have not valued the data. Um, and that data if it is collected in a systematic and structured manner, can be then transposed to a company who has figured out how to do better credit appraisal for a two lakh rupee loan, which is let's say a fintech. So in that sense, a partnership can happen. Similarly, a, an MFI, which is now originating a credit customer for one lakh rupee loan, requires a better process, which is inherent in how repayments can happen how a KYC read can happen and how disbursements in real time can happen, which is disbursement in five minutes. That's again an opportunity for a FinTech to come in and provide those capabilities to an MFI. So a lot of collaboration in that sense, John, which is possible without really invading into each other's territory because FinTechs could be lending FinTechs, FinTechs could be process digitization FinTechs, they could be CRM fintechs. They could be so many different types of financial technology companies, uh, even to the extent of what we are now seeing as people who build capabilities to do statement, bank statement analysis, right? Mm -hmm. 
and if if like to dj's point earlier if we are now wanting to understand what is the dbt amount which has gone into a customer's bank account and how do i assess that bank statement i can go and partner with a fintech who knows how to do bank statement analysis right mm-hmm. so so uh, the way i see it and the capability that is we are building is to see what are the potential collaborations one can do with fintech which is tech pure play technology capabilities and more importantly stay core to the customer engagement process which is acquire quality data engage with the customer deeply service the customer on more products and services and third of course have real impact on livelihood if we stay if the mfi stays core to that i think there is no uh, territory overtaking here um and i see this as a complete collaboration opportunity um and even in a revenue revenue standpoint um mfis can see this as a as a revenue opportunity to say that i discover a customer um which you don't have and there could be revenue sharing as well likewise for a fintech i have technology capabilities where i can generate some fee income and you can simply integrate with your systems so um so john the, this is this been my experience and uh, we ourselves are trying to partner with uh, mfis that are working on ground um at the same time we also have fintech partnerships at the back end um because we work both uh, on the uh, you could say on the underwriting uh, for micro enterprise loans as well as underwriting for customers who are non digitized so we work on both frontiers and we've experienced that uh, this is this is going to be a long road Uh, of collaboration with each other to really service this customer truly and deeply that's how mm-hmm. i look at it no so thank you for that and and maybe um uh, christian you, you can give the perspective from from indonesia i know that the 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 headline story in indonesia is the the growth of the p2p platforms and yeah. um uh, fintech is is all the buzz but um it would be great to hear sort of your your perspective on uh, fintech yeah. versus yeah. digital financial inclusion No, I like the, the distinction that Zweta did on, uh, you know, between uh, lending fintechs and the other fintechs. So, so uh, in Indonesia, lending fintechs are uh, basically exclusively focusing in, on, on urban areas. They are focusing on payday loans, salary loans, consumption loans. So they they are not entering at all uh, the 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 let's say the, the space of of uh, microfinance. Uh, but uh, so so let's say in rural areas because of lack of data because of lack of digital footprint because of the difficulties that uh, whomever tried uh, had in collections because of course uh, it's it's easy to give a loan the problem is then go go in the middle of the rice field and trying to collect the money uh, in, in an efficient way so basically they were losing a lot of money for that so they decide okay it's, it's much easier in rural areas where you know density is high so it's easy to also go and visit people in case um and uh, uh, but on the other end there are a lot of fintechs that do other type of services there are fintech working on payment system so the payment system uh, fintechs in indonesia they are really going very strong you have ovo you have uh, you have uh, uh, gopay and uh, and they are trying to go into rural areas also they are struggling because of course the 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 penetration of of these kind of services in rural areas uh, is not working very well because at the end you do digital payments when you earn also digitally i mean unless unless you receive money digitally is very difficult for you to pay digitally i mean how do you do unless, because then uh, the, the something uh, i think sati said that you need to it's it's about uh, in the service at your doorstep right so before you're actually paying in the center meeting and then suddenly you need to go and upload the money on any wallet far away in an agent or in a bank or whatever and then you can perform the payment so it's not convenient for clients they wouldn't do it um so until the ecosystem the ecosystem can be provided by these these payment uh, payment services providers and we are talking to some of them uh, to try to uh co- cooperate so that they can increase their their the network of agents uh, and and support our clients close to where they live uh, uh, for the provision of e wallets and uh, and uh, and and helping them to upload the money that they earn for instance or even helping them to receive the money in their micro business uh, digitally directly 
And once that happens, then of course for us is is, is a very big plus. So we can support them to to enter these villages and these areas, and they can support us afterwards into uh, digitalize part of our processes and digitalize the, the the payment parts, for instance, which is of course the riskiest that we have at the moment. So it's not a question of relationship because you can maintain the relationship, maintaining the moment of the center meeting because the center meeting will become a service hub. But at the same time, you take away the liquidity risk, the fraud risk, the, the, the huge cost linked to cash handling that we know very well is, is our, one of our major costs. So, so I, I, I believe there are possible synergies, but not with, uh, with fintechs doing lending, which are a different type of animal. They work in different areas. They, they offer different products uh, and, and they have their own issues, uh, which they, need, they will need to solve for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, thank you. Um, uh, perhaps DJ, you can you can address this and, and a little a little different spin on the question. You know, I, I think uh, all of all of this panel are, are busy working to to solve some of the the gaps and and try to address um, uh, some of those places where you still need the human intervention uh, part of it. Um, I think as we start to solve those problems. Do, do we uh, expose ourselves to more competition from fintechs who can then take advantage of that digitized data um, in order to uh, serve our clients differently, more efficiently after we've done the very hard work of, um, of you know, client education, uh, gaining the trust of the client, et cetera. Um, do you see any risks of that? And, and uh, um, it'd be great to sort of hear your, your thoughts on, on fintech versus um, uh, digital financial inclusion business. I, I'm, I think um, I, I would go agree with, uh, you know, Sweta and Christian on the uh, whole concept of, you know, the whole, uh, this uh, digital uh, companies, you know, fintech companies coming and encroaching uh, microfinance space, uh, you know, you have time for that. But I also um, uh, agree, uh, you know, uh, disagree on a one point that they would never come to this space. You know, uh, as you correctly mentioned, it's all about a time, uh, you know, when they can come. In. It can be as early as, you know, WhatsApp started lending. <laughs> If they have that uh, bandwidth to do so. Yes, uh, they have. They why they are not coming? Uh, as uh, you know, Christian exactly mentioned precisely that they are yet to figure out how to get the repayment done. That's the only missing piece because here we are going and collecting. <laughs> so, so the moment it is replaced, you know, as the ecosystem is evolving, and I think I could see that in India, it is, it is uh, you know happening very fast. And if not today, maybe in a year time, maybe in two years time, you will see a very conducive ecosystem for digital payments to happen. Government is supporting, government policies are supporting. Uh, there are technology available. There are technological providers available. The technology is going cheaper day by day. If I, rather, it is incentivizing. You know, if you are using a digital mode today, uh, you know, you are incentivized. You know, if you're buying something, you get additional discount, you get these. You get cash back. There are so many uh, incentivization programs which is available to you if you go digital. So for your client to go digital, you also have to incentivize them. You can't go and charge twenty-two percent and ask them to go digital. So you have to you have to ensure that you know you have to also bring in a product which is more efficient, uh, less expensive. Uh, but then digitization also has a cost. So how do you manage your cost? vis-a-vis uh, -vis what you uh, pass on to your clients. So that is something which MFIs are yet to figure out. At least at Annapurna, we are still trying to figure out how do we how do we bring down the cost and yet we are using a lot of digitization, which has a cost. Mm -hmm. Because if you are, if for example, as, as you know, so I was saying, you could simply go and tie up with a payment solution, but then payment solution will charge you somewhere between 1% 1.5%, then your entire profit is gone. You know, whatever extra money you could have earned, is gone. So I have to replace that cost with some, but something else. And in that process, am I compromising my, you know, basic processes or mm -hmm. the, or the technology is efficient enough to handle that uh, process similar way that, you know, today I'm physically handling, you know, suppose underwriting, if, if I take the entire underwriting digitally and, you know, just don't do it physically, don't send anybody, you know, I'm, 
I take that manpower out of my system. You know, they do something else. You know, I save that cost. Then only I can be in a position to uh, pass on that benefit to the client, or or you know, get into these uh, kind of partnerships where they also earn some revenue. I pass on some revenue to them. But because it's a very tight, uh, you know, uh, in India particularly because of the regulation around us mm -hmm. in MFI sector, you know, we were only able to charge 10% and again for many of these smaller MFIs, it, it is not even that there, you know, they end up somewhere around eight and eight and a half, you know, the latest uh, pricing guideline that we have, you know, there's a methodology, I'm, I'm sure you are aware of it, don't want to get into that. With that, you know, people don't have that 10% margin even, you know, depending on how what your cost of fund is. And then how do you pass, pass on those kind of benefits unless you brought down that six, seven percent of delivery cost to four, five percent. And, you know, mm -hmm. so, so what are the, what are the processes to take out of that? And then what are the processes to be replaced with that? So that is an MFI confusion area that we are still trying to figure out. But my belief is that yes, uh, digitization will happen, whether you like it or not, the, mm -hmm. the processes will start uh, following. We better get ready, you know, whenever, uh, those costs will gone down because the costs can go down because of the volume. If the volume goes up, the transaction volume goes up for the tech companies, obviously costs will go down. You know, we have seen, you know, when smartphones have started coming in, it was pretty expensive. Today, you get a smartphone up five, six thousand rupees. So the technology will eventually will make it much cheaper and, you know, more affordable. I think with that, uh, this will happen. And yes, so you know, you, you either have to, either have to, you know, compete with them in any way, you know, going down, going down the line. Yes, you will be competing with them. Mm -hmm. well, thank you for that. And, and, and maybe I can ask uh, Satish uh, from a, the, the, the industry perspective, uh, uh, solving this issue that, that uh, DJ brought up of, of the challenges of, you know, digitization requires investment. It requires uh, uh, capacity building in our clients, um, as I think all the all the panelists mentioned, uh, you're not simply doing away with the physical. You're you're doing additional value added services, um, and so uh, it's not that expenses are are going down. In some ways, expenses are are increasing. Um, how, especially thinking of of the small entities, um, thinking of sort of the broad industry. Um, how do you see that that gap uh, being addressed uh, generally, and, and is there a role for for government intervention to to help out in that process? Um, uh, how do you how do you see uh, that solution? Uh, that? Yeah, it's uh, it's really uh, as Dipjyoti was mentioning the cost because now um, we always say that uh, uh, technology has the potential to bring down the cost. Uh, but first to have that, you have to invest in technology. So this is again a, a very basic uh, question of uh, putting the cart before the horse. Uh, and as I was mentioning earlier, that uh, uh, pro probably with uh, bigger institutions, uh, which have a healthy surpluses, it's not an issue of uh, uh, investing additionally in technology, but for the uh, smaller institutions, it is a, uh, it is uh, certainly an issue, and uh, uh, we are as a sector association. We are uh, in uh, dialogue with the institutions which have uh, uh, actually fostered the microfinance sector in India, including the government. That uh, uh, what is the type of, to at least access some sort of a, a financial support for. Uh, uh, technology upgradation to the digital processes in the smaller institutions because on their own uh, each institution uh, investing uh, on its own uh, in the technology processes is a, a costly affair so we are looking at uh, because uh, we had an example of uh, uh, nabard as a dfi uh, taking on its uh, uh, agenda to uh, say, uh, get the technology upgradation for the uh, cooperative banking sector, which was at a very 
low level of uh, technology adoption as compared to the commercial banks about 4 uh, 5 years back and uh, it has really helped uh, nabard has chipped in uh, uh, with the financial support as well as uh, uh, enabling a, a, a what we say the sectoral use of uh, uh, technology jointly by many institutions these are some things which we are uh, working on and some proposals are already there uh, with nabard as well as sidbi and the government uh, for uh, eliciting some uh, level of support for the small and medium institutions uh, for their uh, support with regard to the uh, digitization processes and also um, simultaneously with uh, both with uh, government as well as rbi that uh, some of the costs which uh, uh, the institutions have to incur uh, on the payment processes uh, they also can be a little more uh, subsidized uh, to enable more of a digital adoption by the mfis uh, that's also something which uh, uh we are uh, doing some policy advocacy for the uh, sector as a whole because otherwise uh, if a, a huge percentage is charged by the payment wallets and the payment systems uh, then as dj was mentioning that uh, then uh, a lot of our margins will be eroded so these are the areas which uh, we are uh, working at the policy level with the government as well as the dfi uh, and uh, i i can say that there is a, a positive response from them but uh, it should take uh, some time before we uh, reach that point where we will be able to access this fortunately uh, nabard has a financial inclusion fund with it so we are uh, uh, telling both the government as well as rbi as well as nabard that uh, one of these uh, one of the areas which uh, the a financial inclusion fund should look at is supporting the digital financial upgradation as far as the microfinance sector is concerned and there is a positive response but it will still take time for that to actually get converted into reality uh, that apart just one more point i wanted to add that we are talking about fintechs and mfis Uh, we ourselves uh, have uh, at least about uh, three institutions which have joined uh, sadhan last year uh, they are mfis and they want to uh, work uh, in totally uh, branchless and in a digital mode uh, started by very enthusiastic uh, uh, youngsters with a technology background and uh, they are establishing the systems and processes uh, we'll have to see how that works on and as uh, uh, christian was mentioning that uh, to start with uh, these institutions want to work uh, uh, in the urban areas uh, with uh, people who have at least uh, some level of regular uh, uh, wage or salary type of uh, inflows so these are still at a early stages and uh, Uh, this is something which uh, i i think that uh, uh, we will uh, uh, we will be seeing uh, uh, mfis at least uh, working in urban and uh, semi urban areas who will be uh, branchless and probably they may work on a centralized basis also uh, but uh, uh, as they say that the proof, proof of the uh, pie is in uh, proof of the pudding is in eating Uh, we'll have to see how exactly they will uh, structure their collection systems in the absence of a branch or a center no that's very that's a very interesting development to see that um it, perhaps just to, to we spent a lot of time on on all the positives of uh, of digitization and and uh, i think you know as with any technology uh, there there's a, a positive side and then there are side effects which which are more negative and i think i can think of a few that that were uh, uh very concerned about within action and, and certainly you know i think one of the elements is um the impact on on women uh, in particular who who may have uh, less access to 
um, smartphones who may have less access to the digital footprint, et cetera. Um, and, and, you know, I think the, the big question is how do we ensure that uh, we're, we're not leaving those, those key clients behind, but are, are bringing them along. But then I can also think of, you know, all the, um, the, the sort of headline news that, that we see uh, about um, data protection um, and, and uh, the, the adverse effects that uh, uh, digitization technology can bring um, to very vulnerable clients. Um, I, I, I know that uh, uh, I rarely read all of those uh, terms of service and, and, and very blithely sign on to them. Um, and, uh, you know, yet we're, we're expecting our clients to also take similar decisions, perhaps uh, with less capability to, to make those informed choices uh, that are required. Um, I don't know, uh, perhaps, uh, Christian, you can, you can sort of uh, uh, provide a little bit of insight into how you think about uh, at Benarta uh, uh, protecting the client, uh, making sure that no one's left behind in this digital digitization process uh, and, and bringing along our clients rather than, than leaving them behind. Yeah. No, I think that, that, that you know, the, the, the rationale of uh, adopting this digital model, uh, it's also to, to avoid exclusion of a specific segment of clients. As I was mentioning before, at this particular moment, the penetration of smartphone in the family might be high, but the use of smartphone by our specific clients uh, is, is, is low. So we need uh, a, a, a modular process, a gradual process in which our, our loan officer are flexible and they can follow the traditional methodology. So clients can choose whether they want to apply through a mobile phone or they want to apply directly to the to the to the loan officer within the center meeting or within you know the, the individual lending vertical with that, that we also have and and there are clients who might want to do the 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 you know the the, the want to evolve into requesting instead the services and, and loans through digital means there will be clients who will want to pay in the center meeting there will be clients who will pay digitally so uh, um, embracing this level of flexibility i think is fundamental now in the new uh, in the new, let's say, microfinance 2.0, because it's, uh, it's, it, it will be needed. If you don't do that, uh, uh, either you exclude uh, a big chunk of clients, which, also, which is also a loss for the microfinance institution. I mean, uh, if you lose 50% of your clients because uh, the service you're offering are not accessible to them, then it's your loss at the end. No? So it's the loss of the client, but it's, it's also your, your loss. So, so it's, it's extremely important that we maintain flexibility until, of course, uh, the, the, the vast majority of clients can access uh, uh, digital services and it will take time. I agree that we will get there. Uh, I don't know, India seems to be faster than Indonesia for these, especially in rural areas, but in Indonesia will take years still. But we need to be ready, we need to be there. We need to have already a very strong relationship with, to, with clients. Clients need to perceive us as their business partner so that even if someone else offer a different kind of proposition with digital loans uh, and so on, they might prefer us because they trust us, you know, and, and uh, and we will be able to also, also offer that kind of service at that time. So I think that is the, the, the way I see it. At the same time, regulator uh, uh, associations and so on, they need to uh, ensure that these, uh, uh, you know, the client protection principles are applied, are enforced, are, are, uh, are uh, followed by microfinance institutions and fintechs uh, alike, because, because there are issues now, and, uh, and especially in the fintech world in Indonesia, there have been uh, huge problems, uh, uh, not only for, I mean, uh, for the clients themselves, but <laughs> there are cases of clients not repaying. And here it's quite common that the fintech is uh, using the social network of the clients to shame the clients into repaying. So they might send messages to the, you know, if the husband uh, is, is salary to the, to the, to the uh, you know, manager or, or, or to the uh, friend or to the, you know, uh, parents uh, and, and so on. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's improving already because the regulator, uh, you know, found out about this issue and, and revoked a lot of licenses, but uh, it's still happening. So, so even, uh, uh, even for fintechs, uh, uh, we need stronger uh, protection uh, from a client perspective, uh, uh, like it happened for microfinance uh, uh, over, over the years, right? So, so yeah, I think this is, uh, this is the main point. Maybe I can ask Shweta to, if you can uh, uh, provide a little bit of context and, and the Indian context of uh, how to protect 
clients in, in terms of digitization and then how to prevent this potential exclusionary aspect of, uh, uh, of digital uh, transformation. Yeah, yeah, John, I think, uh, um, I think the, the, the foundation of everything that we all are talking about is really empathy to this customer and uh, empathy also translates into, you know, giving the right information and making sure the customer really needs what we are offering to the customer, whether it is a credit product or an insurance product uh, um, in that light. So, so that at least, at least in the work that we are doing, the core aspect of what we call is a customer engagement life cycle is uh, it's like a base product uh, in our entire credit solution. So when we look at the, the branch or the center-based model, where we have uh, you know, a large part of the portfolio in rural areas, um, we have concepts like even before the, uh, the loan is offered to the customer, we call it a loan offer generation, uh, we have something called a welcome call. The customer is not even a, a customer, credit customer right now, but we create a welcome call where we basically engage the customer, ask them all the relevant questions that this is what was asked of you, this is what you provided, and this is your need, etc. And henceforth, we tell them conclusively that this is the type of loan that can be given to you. Would you consent to take um, this, this product? If they agree, that's when the actual loan creation or the loan ID generation in, in our parlance uh, happens. Uh, if At if that point of time, customer says that, no, uh, my need is not there. I just thought maybe, you know, one of those ne necessity entrepreneurs, as we call it, versus mm -hmm. the opportunity entrepreneur. So that kind of um, gauging happens at that point in time. And it also gives the customer to really give that virtual consent over the phone. So we run that process. We also run a post disbursement calling process where we ensure that the money which has been credited into the customer's account, the customer is aware. Uh, the, the usual things like sending an SMS notification, of course, is part and parcel of the whole process. Um, and then we do something which is over and above the loan utilization visit is what we call as a customer check-in call. Uh, wherein, again, we re-emphasize to say that this was your interest rate. This was your EMI amount. Uh, hopefully, you'll be able to repay. Is there a person who visited, etc.? So, you know, you have to really build trust, as Christian was very nicely pointing it out, um, in client protection through the journey. Trust leads to better connect, and better connect leads to uh, sort of retaining your customer for life cycle. Um, that is really helping us have a much deeper and richer engagement uh, with our customers. And we already have reached out to two and a half lakh customers. Um, and we are running it uh, both on the digital as well as the non-digital um, platforms. Well, that's that's great. Um, I, I recognize that we're we're running up to time, and I've been bringing in some of the questions that have been coming in into the conversation throughout. Um, but um, uh, perhaps just one last question, and, and I'll I'll throw it to DJ. Um, you no, know, I think we've been talking about. I think you mentioned DJ sort of a, a view of of the evolution of this this industry that, that uh, certainly um, there will come a point where uh, we, we you know all of our clients will be in the digital world that will take time we need to start approaching it now um, uh, in order to to get there and be addressing those needs but uh, how do you see the um, I think someone referred to it as microfinance 2.0 I don't know whether it's 2.0 3.0 4.0 but where we are but but uh, how do you see the the microfinance institution of uh, you know, five years from now, ten years from now, um, in in terms of digitization. Oh, John, I think uh, you, you know it's a very interesting question to you know to tell you that how microfinance institution will look like uh, you know five ten years down the line in digitization. I think all the microfinance institution ten years down the line will look like a fintech company today. Uh, of, of today's fintech company, but more, uh, you know, as Swetha mentioned, with more robust client production principles around the more robust uh, and more uh, focused design for the requirement of the client, more flexible approaches in build in, uh, in, in terms of the repayment, in terms of uh, supplying the loan, more accurate and in time uh, processes, uh, you know, in place. I think that is how uh, they will look like. Um, in terms of uh, the processes are concerned, I think the uh, biggest challenge all of us are going to face is 
the cultural shift uh, in if within the organization in terms of uh, you know training our manpower processes moving from a very very high touch model to a low touch model um, or a no touch model maybe i don't know when but you know some some day i i wish that in there would be a no touch model coming in but but i think 5 to 10 years in a medium term i think i could definitely say that from a very high touch model we all will be pushed to move to a low touch model uh, bring down the costs control the costs by bringing more efficient technological interventions um you know and more efficient uh, you know underwriting disbursement and collection processes like it can you know it can be 24 hours disbursement today you have rtgs available people can demand a loan at whatever time and you can still deliver them so those things definitely is going to come uh, and it will be better for the people but yes as everybody mentioned the risks uh, uh, around uh, this digital transactions it is all going up every day there are so many frauds happening around a uh, digital transaction uh, people are you know um trapping by calling somebody getting their password getting their uh, you know atm pin uh, doing a lot of this frauds and all but i think eventually the systems will also evolve uh, to take care of these kind of risk uh, management matrices and also uh, the people uh, the education uh, around people around digital transactions and the safety of digital transactions will also uh, be taken care of and uh, as um, as we are talking about uh, yes uh, uh, the technology uh, definitely you know if you have a smartphone today you have so many you know things are available but uh, let us not forget that you know uh, in india also uh, while uh, there are still 50% people don't have that smartphone and you know only only you know uh, 10% of the population use that internet uh, smartphone the rest are not using so we so we will have to rethink the technology maybe uh, the technology to go with uh, more feature phone uh, you know facilities that they can still do transactions with feature phones uh, not necessarily uh, very high end uh, you know sophisticated uh, smartphone technologies basic technology uh, to make their life easy if that works for them they will certainly adopt it with all the uh, with the caveat that the security is concerns are taken care of and their protection concerns are taken care of um, but if these two things are taken care of i think uh, you will see much larger uh, mfi fintech companies going forward no oh, fantastic Th- thank you dj and and uh, conscious of the time i think that's a great wrap up um i really appreciate uh, uh, all of your participation satish dj christian shweta um i think it's been a very robust uh, discussion i look forward to to continuing these discussions hopefully we'll be uh, present at the uh, inclusive finance india summit uh, in person next year and uh, look forward to the chance of meeting uh, all of you uh in person at that time um but uh thank you all for your participation and for the questions that have been coming in that we've incorporated into the conversation um i think it's been a, a very good conversation thank you john thank you john thank you shweta thank you sapi thank you thank you john thank you thank you christian thank you yeah well thank you so much and somebody needs to thank john i suppose uh, so on um also on behalf of the panelists and of course uh, uh, access uh, thank you so much uh, john for all your efforts in putting together this panel i know you uh, you know reached out to everybody with uh, your questions and made efforts to pair thanks everyone for uh, joining in uh, and uh, we hope uh, uh, you will uh, uh, i mean now you can of course uh, you will log out of this uh, um a link but uh, we request the speakers as well to uh, please do join uh, from your participant link that we have provided you for uh, uh, the next um, uh, part of the summit we have uh, a great evening planned uh, we are using the benefit of being virtual to actually uh, stress the day into late evening uh, well but thank you so much for this uh, really engaging uh, and interesting discussion thank you thank you, uh, you radhika thank you thank and you. Uh, i'd like to mention uh, to everyone who is uh, logged in uh, in this hall which is hall a 
uh, that uh, the track, the MFI track, which was uh, being hosted here, is uh, has been concluded with this panel. Uh, and uh, so we request you all to kindly uh, move on to um, uh, the other hall, Hall B, where uh, a parallel track is going on. And at uh, 5.40, we will uh, start uh, a series of very exciting fireside chats. The three fireside chats that are planned this evening uh, until uh, 8.30. So uh, we hope uh, that you will all probably have a short tea and coffee break and then join us uh, into the other hall again. Thank you.